I'm glad that you are here with us for this um, first day of the week lesson. I have done several lessons on uh, God's love and on the love we should have what it is. But I began to look the other day and I want us to look at this idea of loving God. The importance of loving God. To think about this idea where he says, I love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and might. There's more to it than just the, the way we think about love. This idea of remembering him, of seeking him, of, of going after those things he asks of us. In Deuteronomy 6 chapter, in verse 4, uh, well really 1 through 3 to start with, he said, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded you to teach commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land in which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, that your sons and your sons' sons, but you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all the statutes and his commandments I commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Therefore, hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey, this, this land of Canaan. He said, I, I want you to follow me. I want you to recognize me as God. I want you to see me as the Almighty, that one who has given you all of these things, who has cared for you, has seen after you. And then he goes down into verse 4 through 9. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Those, those laws that he gave them, those commandments. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as signs on your hand and they shall be a front with between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In essence, he's telling these people, I, I seek you. I've given you all these things. I've given you the commandments that will give you a life and that will bring you to the land of Canaan. I've done all these things. But he said, I am going to command you to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your mind. To look to God. To remember the God that gave them the things they had. But he had promised them a great promise. If they were faithful. If they were faithful. You see, there are many in the world who would question this command. They would ask, why? Why is it so important? There are those who call themselves children of God and believe that they love the Lord and yet they walk as the world does. I want us to look briefly at the children of Israel, those who were God's chosen in their history. In the book of Exodus, God sought Moses to be his spokesman, to speak and to bring his people to freedom and giving them into the land of Canaan to go to this one called Pharaoh and, and seek God's people to return to bring them to the land that God had promised. And these things, and all these things, he sought their love. Why? Because he was the Almighty, that one with all power, that one who was the creator, that one who had always been. He was that one who was always present, their provider, their shepherd, their peace. Remember he says he traveled in a, a, a pillar by day and a fire by night, he led them. He was there. Show them the way. He was their provider, their shepherd, their peace. He was the one who brought a healing to their people. It was through him that they were sanctified, set apart for his people. He was their defender, their savior, savior from slavery. So as we look at this idea, I want us to remember he's our Savior from sin and all who seek him and in that salvation he becomes all of these things to us. He, he becomes that defender, 
He becomes that one who sanctifies us. He becomes that one who brought about a healing in our lives as his children. He's the one who has made a promise of a land beyond an eternity with him. We see the children of God as Moses brings them to the promised land. They experience the mighty hand of God in their lives. Often praising him and, and then at the next difficult situation, turning against him, bemoaning him, looking as though he could not do anything to help them. They refuse to grow. They refuse to, to seek God and say, God, we need your help this day. And they would turn against him. God would bring them back. And they would pull some some situation where they had forgotten that God was God and they would do horrendous things and God would bring them back. They came to the Jordan. And the 12 spies were sent out to, to look at the land and see what it was about, see what was there. And only two men came back of that, of that 14, of that 12. There were two men who said, it is great, it is good, there's land of plenty and God will help us receive that land. But the other ten stood against them and, and talked to the people and confused them and, and, and began to, to discourage those people and say there's no way that we can, we can beat these people. There are giants in these lands and they live in fortified cities. All the food is great. The things are there but there's no way we can have part of it. They're just too mighty. We find that it dissatisfied God. They would remain in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation had died. All but that one called Joshua and Caleb were to cross with that younger generation into the promised land. Those who had begun the journey, ceased to have a love for God. They sought to be the followers of their own gods. A generation before sought to follow other things, that of the flesh. And God let them die in the wilderness. When Joshua led those people across Jordan into Canaan, they remembered God, they followed in love they were able to conquer the whole land of Canaan. Great cities they conquered, great cities they took. They were living a part where they had all the food, all the, all the things that were necessary for them. They had cities that they did not build. They had crops that they had not planted. But when Joshua died, they began to live just as their fathers, looking at themselves, looking at those fleshly gods that they can come up with. Forgetting God and believing that they could care for themselves, they began to follow the flesh. Eventually came Babylon. After the captivity of Babylon, after they had they had taken captive of the Jews of the Israelites, and after they had destroyed Jerusalem because of their unwillingness to follow God because of the unwillingness of the Israelites to follow God. They were captive for 70 years. There was a remnant. There was a group that was still looking toward God. And we have the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Once again, the people began to resist following God. In about 430 BC, there was a prophecy came through a prophet by the name of Malachi. This would have been in about 430 B.C. This would have been at, at the very last of the time that God communicated with them before the coming of Christ. But in Malachi, the fourth chapter, in five and six, he said, Behold, I will send to you Elijah. This is what God has told him to say. And before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. 
lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And we'll go into this a little bit later and looking at what he's saying. But Malachi is telling them there is going to be a Savior to come. Because of your walking away from God, there's no other way that this destruction will not be faced. Somewhere within that time, a little bit following after the years of Babylon and, and the, the little bit of ability to have the freedom to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. These people found themselves under the rule of the Medio Persian Empire. The temples were rebuilt, the law, the priesthood of Aaron's line had been restored, the Jews had turned from idols. But Malachi's prophecy or warning had not went without cause. They, did the people hear it? No, the Israelites fell to the Greeks, and then to the Egyptians. In, in, within all of this, there is a great history of the Israelites in the 400 years before the coming of Christ. The great difficulties and the pains for the Jews and the falling away from God, they were not their own people. They were in constant turmoil and battle. See, they, they had walked completely away from God. Oh, yes, there was that small group or those groups that, that had their religion, this Judaism, those that, that obeyed or strove to obey those uh, teachers who sometimes were overbearing. But they had corrupted God's word. Tremendously. And so in this 400 years, we have no record of God speaking to his people. There are some records of those who spoke to the people in prophecy. Who told them of things to come, things that were horrid, things that were destructive. And they refused to listen. In Daniel the ninth chapter. And looking at verses 11 through 15, chapter 9, 11 through 15. It says, All of Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. The punishments that he told them were occurring. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us. By bringing upon us a great calamity under, for under the whole heaven there has, been, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and his and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. I want us to think about that. He had told them in, in the time of Moses that if they refused to turn away, he would let them turn away, but he would destroy his people. They would have nothing that was theirs. They, they never had a homeland. They were without, they were without leadership in that 400 years. They had nothing. In Psalm 78, even though written at the time it was written, there was much put out about who this Jesus was, about who the Savior was, about who God was. And yet the people did not listen. They failed to, to want to listen. They had become dull of hearing. In Psalm 78, verse 41, he said, They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power on the day he redeemed them from their foe. Then we go down to verse 56 through 59. Yet they tested and rebelled against the Most High God. They did not keep his testimonies, but they turned away and acted treacherous like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger in their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. 
when God heard he was full of wrath and he utterly destroyed Israel. He forsook the dwelling of Shiloh, the tent where he dwelt among, among mankind and delivered his power to captivity. It sounds like a, such a treacherous thing. But he said, if you will follow my commandments, if you will follow my commandments. They were the chosen of God. They had turned their backs. They were lovers of self, unwilling to recognize the power that had made them people. You see, God had made them his people a people of his pasture, a people that he would take care of, a people that he would see after, a people that he would give all that they needed. And yet, he said, you must love me. Love me. They utterly forgot about it. In Isaiah, the sixth chapter, starting in verse eight, it come to a point where he let their hearts harden. He said, And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, This is Isaiah speaking, Whom shall I send and and whom shall I go and whom will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me, and he said, Go and say to the people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and the land is desolate waste. And the Lord removed people far away, and, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and through the tent, and though the tent remain in it, it will be burned again, like the turbineth or the oak whose stump remains. Then it is felled, the holy seed, as its stump. I want us to understand that as he speaks these things, it was in a prophecy to his people in the time of destruction. That which lay before them, but they also, but it was also to take place as Jesus sought to bring the Jews to him once again. See, it is a warning here. It is telling them what they're going to do. They're going to look and they're not going to see. They're going to hear, but they're not going to hear anything. They've been told of the Messiah that is coming to save them. And yet, no one heard. They've been told how he would come and yet no one saw. And so when God, when Christ came to the Jews, when he came as Christ, once again, they would not recognize him. The last phrase he says, there will be an offspring there, the holy seed, it is the stump. He says, or an offspring, the holy seed, the holy seed, or an offspring. We have to realize that he's telling that there will be a, that Jesus will come again, that Christ will be here. But in the last or as they prophesied the Messiah, and yet few look toward him. But we go over into Luke, we hear once again what he says here. In Luke, the first chapter, going into verse 16. He says, and he will go, this is what he says, this comes from Malachi. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord and their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and, and the disobedient to the wisdom and of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He's talking to Zechariah, he's, he's telling him, your son will proceed, he will come before as John the baptizer, he will become before God. He will come as Elijah. He will come to, to speak the words 
that lead men to Christ. He will make straight the path for the Messiah. Then he might have a way to the children that they might see him, that they might know him. That he might, he might say, set things up for the Christ coming. But over in John, the 12th chapter, somehow comes the most discouraging news. With all that John the Baptizer had done, with all that God had done for the people in giving them the thought that there would be a Messiah, no one saw, no one believed. In John, the 12th chapter, starting in verse 35, He says, so Jesus said to him, the light is among you for a little while longer. In other words, he's saying Christ is here, this Jesus. He said, walk while you have light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is or where he is going. While you have light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. And when Jesus said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. See, they did not believe. Verse 37 says, Though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words of Isaiah might be fulfilled. That they closed their ears. They closed their eyes to see this one who had been sent to them because God loved so much. God loved so much. I want us to stop here for just a moment and reflect a bit more on the history of the Israelites for 4,000 years. God had sought the love of his people. He had brought them out of captivity. He had given them all, and yet they failed to love him. They failed to see him as the Almighty, to acknowledge him. To remember him as they should. They failed to look toward the Messiah that was to come. But yet he loved them. I don't know if we ever really comprehend what's been said. They had turned their back against him so many times. They had left him without anything. They had sought other gods of all kinds who could do nothing for them rather than living for this one. Who had done everything for him. He loved them. He sought a way for his people to be reconciled. To him. There were those few out of the multitudes who remained his. I want us to think about it. The multitudes over 4,000 years there were only small handfuls that remained his. He sought them all. He would suggest, or I would suggest, he sought them all with great pain, with great grief, because they would not come. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people of the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's speaking to us today. God loved his people so much. Now we have a look at this for 6,000 years. He has loved them so much that he gave his son on the cross. Even with people turning away from him, it brings new meaning to this idea of yet while, while we were yet sinners. While we were yet enemies to the cross.
without Savior, without this Savior, man would have found himself without hope. This is what he says in Isaiah. It was either to have a son of that one who would save us calm or utter destruction. Mark 12. Mark 12, verse 28. It says, and, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered, he's talking about Christ. Seeing that he answered them well, ask him which commandment is, in, is the most important of all. And Jesus answered, the most important commandment is hero Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe, I want us to listen to what he says, you said to him, You're right, teacher, you have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Do you hear what he's saying? This idea of loving God. He gave him the commandments. He gave him all of the sacrifices. He gave him everything to do. And yet the love was the most important thing that was there. And as we live our life today. In that six thousand years, which that which what that which God seeks has never changed. You see, He seeks our love. If we will give Him our love, if we will give a genuine love, then we will follow everything He gives us. If we will have a genuine love, we will do everything that He asks us to do. If we have a genuine love for him, we will live our life with Christ in it. We will acknowledge him. We will offer him praise. Our willingness to tell others of this love that he has. Living our life for him. When we come down to the very point of it, to the very end of this thought, it's not about those people out there anymore. They're past. Those things are gone. But they were a warning. They were an example to us to see who we were, who we were supposed to be, what we're supposed to do. And we can say we love God. But do we love God? The question that has to be asked, each one of us have to ask this question is, where do I stand? Where do I stand? What am I doing? Am I, am I living my life for God? Am I doing the things he asked me to do? Am I seeking to be his child? Am I, am I genuinely looking to him in love, remembering that he saved me from, from sin? That he gave me salvation, that he has offered me an eternal home with him? Am I remembering that there are people without that are lost in sin? Am I, am I seeing those things? As we look, as we look at the scripture, we listen to those who say, well, you're to love the Lord your God. We look at scripture. As we follow the word of God, we find few are there that have genuinely loved. Or it seems like a lot of people because that's who we dwell on. That's who we search the scriptures for. But the multitudes before fell away. The multitudes before rejected him. The multitudes before put him across. That included us. Our sins placed him there. Through that cross, there was a forgiveness given that 
that was able to cleanse every man. If he was one who saw God, if he was one who loved God. In Matthew 7, verse 13, some of the most discouraging words that are written, yet some of the most encouraging words that are there. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. That gate that, that Satan opens for us is so easy to follow. That path is so easy to walk because it's a wide path. You can do anything, you can have anything, you can be anybody. But he said, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Leads to that life eternal. Is it narrow? Oh, it is to look at. But it is a it is a gate and a path that God is with us on. It's a gate and a path that God has opened up to us through the blood of Christ. And yet many, many, many refuse it. They seek not to follow Christ in baptism. They seek not to follow Christ in work. They cease to not let God live or Christ live within them. They said, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard. In other words, it goes against what man wants for himself. And those who find it are few. The question today for us, is if we are children of God, if we're living our life, are we following the narrow way? Are we letting God walk with us in this path? If I'm walking with him, and yes, he's helping me. But he says, love me. Love me. If you love me, if you love, if you love who I am, if you love the things I've done for you, you will love God. You will follow. You will follow in the steps of Christ. You will do the things that Christ asks of us. Jude talks about this. In verses 17 through 23. He says a lot here. We don't read Jude too often. And Jude was a brother of Christ. The closer we get to the time of Christ, the more difficult it's going to become. Just that way. People seek for themselves. The world seeks for itself. He said, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there would be scoffers. When he says those last times, he's talking about the time from Christ to the time of Christ coming back. Following their own ungodly passions, it is these who cause divisions. Worldly people devoid of the Spirit, but you, beloved, he's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the child of God, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. He means to love God and love man. To seek to do his will. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads you or that leads to eternal life. That home in heaven with him, that which he has promised those who are his children. We either walk with him or we walk away from him. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. What's he telling us? He's saying if you're a child of mine. If you love me. If you love me, you walk with me. If you love me, you will let Christ live in you. If you love me, you will love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you will tell him about me. You will tell him about God. We can look at that and we can think such a harsh, harsh life, such a difficult way to live. 
And yet, just as the people, just as the people had done, they forgot who God was. They forgot what God had done for them. They forgot about all the times that God had rescued them. Are we willing to forget about that God who rescued us from sin? That God who has told us to love him and follow his commandments, we have an eternity in him. We can look at all the options, but we cannot fail. But look at God and realize the greatness of the love he had for us. Are we willing to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind? Are we willing to walk that line? This may be a lesson that calls us to task, and yet it is a lesson of love. God said, love me. Love me. Seek to do my will. And you have eternity with me. That should be a hard decision. And yet so many people look and see and say, I will never be a slave. Walk away. Living their life a slave to evil and to Satan. Once again, where do I stand? Where do I stand? I hope you will think about these thoughts, about these who had lived their life, the examples they set. Yes, there were those who were great examples of living their life for God, and yet there were those who were great examples of seeking to walk away from God. And they found themselves in destruction. They found themselves in an eternity, but in an eternity of Satan. We need to genuinely look and see what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I want to thank you for being here today, and may God bless.